Good morning, Cross Point. We're going to be getting started in the next few seconds. So if you can hear my voice, this is your cue to come and join us in the main area. Once again, we're about to get started in the next half a second. Come join us. you've done 
greet one another this morning? So good morning, good morning. Once again, welcome to Cross Point this morning, as you may see. Um, oh, here we go. Man, that last song we sang is one of the songs I was talking to the worship team that, like, say they're like, hey, Anthony, are you available to come? We're going to be doing, like, a camp out with a bunch of youth and, and sing some songs of worship. This is the one that's always in the bag because I feel like we've sung it so many times, it feels comfortable. But in that same way, I'm like, man, the words of that song are so powerful as we're looking at it singing this this is the amazing grace this unfailing love that you would take my place and bear my cross you will lay down your life that i may be set free jesus i sing for all that you've done for me and to think that you would think the finished cross, work on the cross was sufficient yet he continues to lavish us with blessings and gives us the breath that we have in our lungs this morning and those are things that we can take for granted. Also, like a song like this that we've sung so many times. And I was brought to Psalms 103 this morning, verses 1 through 5. And it says this, Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my innermost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your disease. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles this is the god who we serve that i don't know if you are celebrating this morning if you had an amazing week if god has just been uh, um having you in a, in a place where you're just worshiping worshiping him in a, in a time of goodness or if you're in a, in, in a pit right now if you're in darkness if you're surrounded and you're reaching out to god from a, a, a place of mourning and hurts and needing his grace i don't know what it is but regardless he's calling us to worship him with all of our soul with all of our heart with all of our might so as we sing of the goodness of God this morning, I want that to be in the forefront of our mind that we serve a God that is good regardless of what we are going through. He is good because of what he has accomplished. He is good because that is who he is. Um, so if you're familiar with this song, church, I want you to just sing along with us this morning. Um, and if it's new to you, just reflect on the words above. Um, but let us worship our king this morning. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held.
just want you to be part of our lives, but we need you to be Lord of our lives, God. We ask you to take center stage this morning as your gospel is proclaimed in this room, God, and we lift up the needs of this community, God. We lift up the ongoing prayers for the Ross family, for the Fricks, God, as they continue treatments, Lord, on this this process, God, I pray that you may give doctors and physicians uh, wisdom on how to proceed, Lord. We pray for the needs of the community that are unspoken, Lord, that um, we need you to intervene on, Lord. I pray for um, the people that serve in every capacity, God, that you may bless them sevenfold, Lord, that where we serve from comes from an aspect of worship and not just deed and doing things, Lord, but because you've given us access to your throne room, Lord, and we want to serve.
serve one another with that same love, God. We pray for New City and Justin and Donnie as they continue to um, work with that church plant, God. We thank you for everybody that is there helping them and that is by their side, God. And I pray as they go through the book of Genesis as well, Lord, that it just may renew something new within the hearts of that same congregation. And we pray for um, in our, our sister churches around um, Florida, um, every campus that's represented, every pastor that's represented, God, I pray that you may pour over them the same grace um, to them as well, Lord, as they go through the story of God. And I pray that as we go through this, it's not just stories, but it, it may transform us and allow, allow us to go into this world with the mind frame that we want to take this world and um, shout out the good news of Jesus Christ for it brings change, Lord. So bring with us, be with us, be with Jim as he brings the word this morning, God. We need you, Lord. Ready our ears and still our hearts. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we all pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, church. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. It's a wonderful day to be in God's house and uh, share the word of God together. Uh, Marissa Masson is going to pre uh, read the, the scriptures today, so if you'd all stand while she reads. Genesis 25, verses 19 through 34. These are the family records of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took as his wife, Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Paddan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord was receptive to his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. But the children inside her struggled with each other, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the, el the older will serve the younger. When her time came to give birth, there were indeed twins in her womb. The first one came out red looking, covered with hair, like a fur coat, and they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out grasping Esau's heel with his hand. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. When the boys grew up, Esau came, became an expert hunter, an outdoorsman, but Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for wild game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field exhausted. He said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff because I'm exhausted. That is why he was also named Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, said Esau, I'm about to die. So what good is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to Jacob and sold his birthright to him. Then Jacob gave bread and lentil stew to Esau. He ate, drank, got up, and went away. So Esau despised his birthright. Genesis 27, 1 through 17. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak 
that he could not see, he called his older son Esau and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Look, I am old and do not know the day of my death. So now take your hunting gear, your quiver, and your bow, and go out in the field to hunt some game for me. Then make me a delicious meal that I love, and bring it to me to eat, so that I can bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening to what Isaac said to his son Esau. So while Esau went to the field to hunt some game to bring in, Rebekah said to her son, Listen, I heard your father talking with your brother Esau. He said, Bring me game and make a delicious meal for me to eat, so that I can bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now, my son, listen to me and do what I tell you. Go to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, and I will make them into a delicious meal for your father, the kind he loves. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. Jacob answered Rebekah, his mother, Look, my brother Esau is a hairy man, but I am a man with smooth skin. Suppose my father touches me, then I will be revealed to him as a deceiver and bring a curse rather than a blessing on myself. His mother said to him, your curse be on me, my son. Just obey me and go get them for me. So he went and got the goats and brought them to his mother. And his mother made the delicious food his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of her older son Esau, which were in the house, and had her younger son Jacob wear them. She put the skins of the goat, young goats on his hands, the smooth part of his neck. Then she handed the delicious food and the bread she had made her, to her son Jacob. This is the word of our Lord. Thank you, Marissa. You may be seated. For those who don't know me, my name is Jim Fox. And most of you know me as uh, the husband of Candy. She's, she's the famous one in our family and prepares all the food here and does all the, all the social events and uh, is the great cook that she is. She's sick this morning, so if you pray for her, she gets sick last night and uh, is home in bed. This, as you can see, is a massive passage of scripture, and it's not all. There's even more to it than what Marissa read, so... It's going to be, we'll probably be here till about 3 o'clock today, so I hope you all are prepared for a long stay. We're going to be talking about the patriarchy, the, the continuation of the patriarchs. We had Abraham, we had Isaac, and now we're going to have the third patriarch, Jacob, today, and how he was selected as the patriarch. So this will be the next generation. Uh, there, to give you the big idea for today... Decisions that we make often have consequences far into the future. So decisions that we make today often have consequences far into the future. We're going to see that as a result of the interactions of this family. We're going to begin by looking at the lives of two men. They were brothers. They were twins, fraternal twins, much different in looks. And uh, even though you often think of twins as being closely bonded, having a lot that they share in life, these two did not. They were totally different. They were different in looks and physical build, apparently, um, and also in outlook on life. So they're very different. And uh, we can see that as the story continues. They were the only sons of Isaac and Rebecca. Uh, Isaac got married when he was 40 years old. For 20 years, they had no children, and as you know, that was the thing that everybody wanted another generation. Everyone wanted sons in the family, and so uh, Isaac prayed, 
God answered his prayer, and after 20 years, uh, they had twins. It was a, a difficult pregnancy, as you read. And so uh, Rebecca had a question for God. She said, why, God, am I like this, am I this way? And here's what God's answer was, really amazing and, and far reaching into the future. He said, two nations, two ethnos, talking about people groups, uh, tribes, that kind of thing. Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will come from you, and they will be separated. Now, these two would be the progenitors of the two tribes, which became Israel and Edom. Uh, Israel is still is, is around today, as we know, uh, fighting for its life over in the Middle East, and Edom has long since disappeared from the historic scene. He said, one people will be stronger, and the older will serve the younger, which is the opposite of the normal situation where the older one uh, has the leadership. So let me read a verse out of, or a couple of verses out of Romans chapter 9. And it says this, Paul writes, Rebecca conceived children through one man, our father Isaac. And for though her sons had not yet been born, and they had done nothing good or bad, so that God's purpose according to election might stand, not from works, but from the one who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. So we're talking about God's sovereign choice of a man here. And God sovereignly chose Jacob, not because he was better, not because he did anything right or anything like that, but in God's sovereign choice, he chose Jacob to be the next one uh, in the line of the patriarchs and to receive the... Uh, uh, the blessings of Abraham. So let's look first at the birth. We're going to look at the birth, we're going to look at the birthright, and we're going to look at the blessing today. So first we're going to look at the birth. So when these boys came out, the first baby came out, and he was red-complected and hairy all over, and they named him Esau. And Esau is kind of a pun uh, in that language in Hebrew uh, having to do with being hairy. Now, whenever you read this, it sounds kind of odd, doesn't it? Um, let me tell you a little story. Uh, we had, and I won't reveal any names, but uh, I intimately knew a baby that was born a number of years ago. And this baby was born, a little girl, and she was full of fine black hair all over her body. She had hair on her face, all over her back, her arms, her legs, this little tiny baby was as hairy as Esau, only she was black uh, hairs. Now, fortunately, um, all those hairs came off, and she's now a beautiful young woman. But it is funny that, uh, that I am always reminded of her when I read about Esau and what he looked like. The, uh, the second baby that came along was Jacob, and he came literally on the heels of Esau. He was actually grabbing a hold of Esau's heel when they were delivered. So it was like a daisy chain. One baby came, and the other came hanging on to the first. And so they named him Jacob, and Jacob is the idea of a heel grabber, is literally the word of it, or one who puts the heel down, that kind of an idea. And it means a manipulator or a supplanter. So the next time you're thinking about naming your little baby boy, uh, Jake is a great name, isn't it? I love that name, Jake, Jacob. Just remember that all these names have meanings. And so you might be calling him the little heel grabber. So anyway, uh, in one verse, the men, the boys grow up. That's one thing I like about Genesis is that they don't waste any time with the history. So they're babies at one verse, and the very next verse, they're young men. And it tells us that, he, that Esau was an expert hunter. He was skillful with the bow. He loved the outdoors. He would go hunting and bring game back to the home for, for food. And uh, he was the outdoor guy, the kind of everybody likes, you know, the rugged kind of guy. And uh, he was the favorite of Isaac. Isaac loved his son Esau. He liked the food that he brought back to the home. He loved that savory uh, food that, that um, Esau was able to make with his game. Jacob, on the other hand, was a little different. It tells us he was a quiet man. Uh, your Bible says that he lived at home. Um, 
The NES says that he was living in tents, and that's kind of the idea. They, they didn't live in a little home, but rather in tents uh, back in those days. And um, it doesn't say any more about him, but obviously uh, uh, Jacob was a shepherd as well. And if we read into the story of Jacob's life, uh, he, you see that he was involved in shepherding, shepherding uh, all of his life. His dad, Isaac, was a man who owned lots of land or lots of uh, possessions, and uh, he owned flocks and herds. And so Jacob would have been familiar with uh, shepherding. So even though it's not mentioned here, we see that uh, Jacob was a shepherd all of his life. But we see at the first right away that there are problems in this family because it says Rebekah loved Jacob. So Isaac loved Esau, Rebekah loved Jacob, and those favoritisms warred against one another and caused all kinds of problems. And this had implications for the boys' lives for the whole rest of their lives. And uh, so remember what I said earlier about the uh, decisions we make today will, make, will determine many things about our future. And uh, it happens in a family like this where there's parental uh, favoritism shown with the, with the children and also uh, the interaction between the boys themselves. So this is an old story. I don't know if you're familiar with the Bible that much, the book of Genesis. If you've read through and you've read this story before, it's kind of an odd story. Um, so let's look at it and see what it has to say. First of all, uh, they start bartering. As soon as they're old enough, they start bartering for the birthright. So let's talk about a little bit. What is the birthright? What does it involve? And generally, this is what a birthright is. The birthright in those days was that the oldest son received the birthright. So the one who was in line for the birthright was usually the firstborn. He got a double portion of the possessions of his father. And also, if there was land involved, he often got the land as well. He became patriarch of the family. And in this case, he would be the heir of the Abrahamic, Abrahamic covenant. Now, remember this, when we talk about the birthright, we talk about the, the, uh, 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 all the debate between these two boys, remember that no matter what these two boys do, no matter what agreements they enter into, no matter what they do, the older will serve the younger because God ordained it to be so. So no matter what they do, God will eventually uh, have the older serve the younger. So sometimes we think we can manipulate things with God, but God is sovereign, and his sovereign choice will always prevail. Now, we also want to look at this little uh, interchange between the two boys, and I want to say this, that Jacob did nothing wrong in this bargain. We often see him as being the bad guy in this bargain, but he did nothing wrong. So let's look at what happens in this, um, in this little interchange, and also... As we read this, we, we get insights into what Esau was like and what Jacob was like personally, what their personalities were like. So let's look at the dialogue. In verse 29, it says, Once Jacob was cooking a stew, and Esau came into the field exhausted, and he said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff because I'm exhausted. And that's why he was also named Edom. Some verses say that he said he was famished, starving. Sounds like a teenager, right? Comes in from outside, said, Mom, I'm starving, you know. And uh, he had only been out in the field for a day, so he hardly was starving. He, he might have been exhausted. Who knows? But Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. And remember how important this birthright is, right? Because the birthright, he's the, the, the primary person in the family, receives a double portion. All of those things are involved. And so Jacob shrewdly says, Sell me your birthright. I look at Esau's response. He says, look, I'm about to die. So what good is a birthright to me? This guy's a drama queen. And so he says, uh, Jacob says, and will swear to me first. So he swore an oath to Jacob. He swore an oath that he would sell the birthright for a bowl of soup, a slice of bread, and something to drink. And so he swore to Jacob and sold his birthright to him. Then Jacob gave bread and lentil stew to Esau. He ate, drank, got up, and went away. So Esau despised his birthright. 
such a, a commentary to the insight into Esau's character that he despised the birthright, which he was, would have normally been entitled to. There's a verse in Hebrews, chapter 12, that says uh, several verses. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness spring up, causing trouble and defiling many. And make sure that there isn't any immoral person or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. For you know that later when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected even though he sought it with tears because he didn't find any opportunity for repentance. Repentance there means the idea of changing his mind. Once this deed was done, there was no going back. So when we look at Esau, we see that he was an irreverent and a godless man. And we see that for the rest of his life. He was a man who lived for the moment. He took the opportunities as they came, not thinking about the future. We also see something else at the end of chapter 40, uh, 26, which we didn't read because it talks about Isaac and Rebekah in that chapter, in between the chapters we're reading today. But at the very end of that, chapter 26, uh, we see something else about Esau. It says, when Esau was 40 years old, he took as his wives Judith, daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Basimath, daughter of Elon, the Hittite. They made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. So in addition to all the other shortcomings that he had, he also went out and married uh, pagan women. At this time, Isaac was 100 years old when, this, uh, when this, these weddings took place. Now, Jacob's character was different than Esau's. And by the way, he wasn't necessarily a good man. He was just a different kind of a man. <clears throat> it says that Jacob was shrewd. He was shrewd in dealing with the birthright. And he was also supplanting. And the idea of supplanting is you take the place of another. So he was a supplanter. The idea of the heel grabber, grabbing on. And we will see, too, that he was also a liar. So let's continue on uh, with the third part of our message today. And that's the idea of the blessing. Now we read in uh, chapter 27. We, we skipped over chapter 26 because it dealt with Isaac and Rebekah, went to chapter 27, and we read now about the blessing. <coughs> Excuse me. So in, uh, in the life of the, of the patriarchs and in these families, oftentimes there was a blessing. The father would bless his sons. And these blessings were oftentimes predictive. And so it came to the place in their life where, Gen uh, where uh, Isaac wanted to bless his son, Esau. Now it tells us that Isaac was nearly blind and he was old. And we wonder how old was he at this point. And by the way, there's, there's not much given. The, like I said, uh, periods of time change rapidly and as we read the book here. But uh, we wonder how old is he? So some estimated that he was about 137 at this time. Uh, Isaac lived to be 180 total. Now, uh, that never seemed quite right to me, 137, because that meant that the sons would have been 77 at this time, and Jacob hadn't even, or Esau, uh, I'm sorry, Jacob hadn't even left home yet, and he hadn't been married or had children or anything else. So 77 would seem a little old for this point. There was another estimate that put uh, Isaac closer to maybe 115 years old. The sons would have been 55 approximately, and that would seem more likely to me. So let's go with that, okay? Because it, it seems to make more sense in this idea. And uh, you realize that after this, after this blessing takes place, uh, Jacob is going to leave. He's going to travel hundreds of miles to his ancestral home. He's going to marry four women. He's going to have 12 children. He's going to amass a fortune. He's going to come back home again, and his dad still won't be dead. His dad will still be alive. So obviously, uh, Isaac was not as old as he thought he was, but he obviously felt old, and he couldn't see, which would have been a, a real uh, disappointment. Now, a birthright is something different than a blessing, just so we don't get the two confused. When Jacob was old, now we're talking about the son Jacob, when he was old, he was living in Egypt. His son Joseph, remember, had 
preceded them to Egypt, and, and Jacob and his sons followed. And near the end of his life, he took all 12 of his children, and he blessed each one. So blessings can go to all the children. As a matter of fact, he blessed two of his grandchildren, the both, uh, both sons of Joseph. So a blessing is something that a father can do to each one. But the, uh, uh, but the birthright is only given once to one of the children. It seems, though, that um, uh, J or es uh, Isaac confused that a little bit because we see where uh, he put, uh, he mingled parts of the birthright into the blessing. And I think what it was, he was trying to reverse the uh, sale of the birthright and give it back to, uh, to Esau. So we see that uh, Isaac calls his son and tells him that uh, he wants the blessing before he dies, thinking that he's near death. And so he sends him out into the field. He says, go out, take your bow, take your quiver. I want you to shoot some game. And I want you to make some of that great stew that you know I like. So apparently he's something he's accustomed to doing. Uh, killing game, making this great savory stew, uh, giving it to his father. His father loved it had that bond with his son Esau. And so uh, he sent him out into the field to uh, hunt. And he said, when you come back, I'm going to bless you. Now, Rebecca overheard the conversation. And she immediately saw what the implications were in her mind uh, that the blessing would go to Esau instead of her son Jacob. Now, just to be reminded that nothing that these people do is going to change the fact that the birthright is going to go to Jacob. They didn't have to manipulate. They didn't have to cheat. They didn't have to lie. They didn't have to do any of those things because God would have made it so, because God decreed it that Jacob would be served by Esau. So she gets her son Jacob. She calls Jacob in, and she says to him, tells him what she had overheard and that they need to act. So she sends him out to the flock and she says, go to the flock, get two choice young goats. And I can imagine these goats are very, very, very young, very, very small, set apart for a particular meals. So they were the choice goats. It would have been nice and tender. And she said, bring me those two choice goats and uh, so that I can make a nice, delicious, savory meal that you can give to your father. She also took some of Esau's clothing that she found in the house to put on her son Jacob so that uh, the deception could be uh, carried out. Now, one of the things that Jacob immediately said was, listen, uh, you know, he's, he's going to know that I am not Esau because he's a hairy man and I'm a smooth man. So she said, well, I'll tell you what, she took the goats after they were skinned. She took the skin of the goats, and she somehow wrapped them on his arms and his hands, both sides, wrapped some around his neck, so that when his father felt him, he would fight, feel the hair of the goats rather than the smooth skin of uh, Jacob. Now, one commentary says that these were oriental camel goats. I've never heard of one before. said that their wool is black, silky and fine textured and it's used as a substitute for human hair so maybe that was it anyway that's what this commentary said there was a funny uh, parallel that took place uh, in my experience very recently I have a friend named Ryan who uh, raises cattle out in Iowa and right now is the birthing season if you go down in the in the ranch areas around here you see it full of calves because spring is the calving season so right now all of his cows are delivering calves. So, and he's, he attends to most of them to make sure they're okay. He does have a huge herd. It's a small operation. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, one of the cows, as it delivered a very large calf, uh, got into difficulty and died during the, during the delivery. So he had an orphan calf and uh, no mother for which, for which it should be feeding on to nurse from. He is a neighbor who is also a, a small rancher raising cattle. And that man had a cow who delivered 
a calf, and a calf died. So we have a, a cow that had just delivered a calf, and we have a calf without a mother. And what they did, they decided to put them together and, uh, so that the calf would have a mother. The problem is that oftentimes cows will not accept a foreign calf, won't accept a calf that's not her own. So what they did, which is really ingenious, is they took the dead calf, they skinned it, they put the skin on the live calf, actually tied it on its legs, on its back. It, they brought it to the cow. The cow sniffed it, smelled just like her own calf, and she's now nursing that little calf who's really an adopted calf. So now that's in the animal world. This is in the human world. But I just thought that was interesting that that parallel happened, you know, that um, uh, the same kind of thing did happen in my experience so now we have uh, Jacob. He's ready to go in. His mother is prepared to stew, ready to take it in to his father. He's dressed in his brother's clothes. He has this, the, the uh, goat skin on his arms and on his neck. And uh, probably got his fingers crossed, I would think. So let's read about the, uh, the interaction here. Now, Jacob, when he goes to his father, he tells his father three lies. And this is what I said earlier, that Jacob, one of his problems was with deception and lying. And so in, in uh, chapter 27, verse 18, it says, When he came to his father, his father, he said, My father, and he answered, Here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob replied to his father, First lie, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I have done what you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may bless me. Now, Isaac said to his son, How do you find it so quickly, my son? And here comes the second lie. Because the Lord your God made it happen to me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come closer so I can touch you, my son. Are you really my son, Esau, or not? So he's got lots of questions. And Jacob came closer to his father, Isaac. And when he touched him, he said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau, so he blessed him. And again he asked, Are you really my son Esau? So this, this man should have had enough awareness, even though he couldn't see, to realize something was, was afoot. Here's the third lie. And Jacob replied, I am. I am really your son. Then he said, bring it closer to me and let me eat some of my son's game so that I can bless you. Jacob brought it closer to him and he ate. And he brought with him wine and he drank. And then his father Isaac said to him, please come closer and kiss me, my son. So he came closer and kissed him. And when Isaac smelled his clothes, he blessed him. And so here's the blessing that he passed on to his son Jacob, thinking he was blessing Esau. He said, ah, oh, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. So his first blessing was, may God give you from the dew of the sky, the dew of heaven. Speaking about rain, Candy and I yesterday morning drove south of Kissimmee, about 20 miles to the Double C Bar Ranch. They have a big blueberry patch there. We went picking blueberries yesterday. Jenny went along with us. We had a great time. It was a beautiful day. And, uh, but anyway, as I was going down the rows of blueberries, the ones up on top were covered with dew. And as I picked them, I thought about this passage when he says, uh, may God give you from the dew of the sky. It just reminded me how God is so good to us. He blesses us with the, the rain and the dew, the moisture from heaven. He says, from the riches of the land and abundance of grain and new wine. So he said, not only should you receive rain, but you receive bounty from the earth. May peoples serve you and nations bow in homage to you. So now he's talking about the birthright issues. Be master over your relatives. May your mother's sons bow in homage to you. And those who curse you will be cursed. And those who bless you will be blessed. And so in an attempt to re 
reversed the, uh, the birthright, he instead just reinforced it again with his son Jacob. And again, we just want to be reminded that no matter what they did, no matter what shenanigans were played, they weren't going to make a difference in God's plan that Jacob would be served by Esau. Now we get to a part that's not been read today. This is a long passage. Hope you bear with me as we can just read the final uh, passage and also make some comments on it. Because Esau did receive a blessing, but it was a far different blessing. So in chapter 27, verse 30, it says this, As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had left the presence of his father Isaac, his brother Esau arrived from his hunting. He also made some delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father get up and eat some of his son's game so that you may bless me. What a shock to his dad. But his father Isaac said to him, who are you? And he answered, I am Esau, your firstborn. Now Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably. Who was it then, he said, who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it all before you came in, and I blessed him. Indeed, he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me too, my father. But he replied, Your brother has come deceitfully and took your blessing. Now I want you to pay close attention to what Esau says because this is full of mistruths. So, Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob, heel grabber, supplanter? For he has cheated me twice. He took my birthright, which he didn't take, he bought. And Esau even swore an oath to give it to him for a pot of porridge. So he said, he took my birthright, and look, now he has taken my blessing, which he did. And then he asked, haven't you saved a blessing for me? But Isaac answered Esau, look, I have made him a master over you, have given him all of his relatives as his servants, and have sustained him with grain and new wine. What can I do for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, do you only have one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. And Esau wept loudly. 55-year-old man standing there in front of his dad, bawling like a baby. And so he gives him a blessing. Now, it's certainly a, a far less encouraging blessing, but he blessed him nonetheless. And he said this, your dwelling place will be away from the riches of the land. You won't have the, the rich land where you live. Away from the dew of the sky above, it won't be a rainy place. You will live by your sword. Going to be a warrior. Going to be a man of war. Going to be a violent man. And he turned out to be just that. You will serve your brother, but when you rebel, you will break his oak from your neck. Now, let me just say this about, just a little bit before we close. This whole idea of Jacob and Esau and the future that we see for them is not just Jacob and Esau, but it's their descendancy as well. It's their families that go on into the future. And we do see that Israel, Jacob had his name changed to Israel, and Esau his, his descendants were the Edomites. And the Israelites and Edomites were enemies all of their existence. Uh, Edom was located just south and east of the Dead Sea. When, uh, when Moses was leaving, leading the children of Israel out of the, the wilderness after 40 years of wandering, and he was getting ready to take them into the Promised Land, he had to go through Edom. And so he sent messengers said, listen, let us go through the land. We won't turn to the right. It won't turn to the left. You won't eat any of your food or drink any of your water. Just let us pass through on the way to the promised land. And the Edomites would not allow them. As a matter of fact, they sent warriors out to turn them away. And that just gives you an indication of what the, the future is like for these two groups. But as we know today, Israel is still a nation. Israel is still an identity. And Edom is long since gone. And so after the blessing, we just read these few verses. Esau held a, a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And Esau determined in his heart, 
The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother, Jacob. When the words of her older brother, older son, Esau, were reported to Rebekah, she summoned her younger son, Jacob, and said to him, Listen, your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. So now, my son, listen to me. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him for a few days until your brother's anger subsides. Until your brother's rage turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Now, this little trip to Haran is hundreds of miles away. Uh, once he gets there, he will be there for, I don't know, 20 years. We don't know how long, but quite a long time. And uh, Esau never forgets <laughs> what was done to him. So he won't forget. So he won't be there just a few days. Then she says, then I will send for you and bring you back from there. Why should I lose you both in one day? Now, unfortunately, after he left, he never saw his mother again. Rebecca never saw her son Jacob again, never saw her grandchildren again. So her plotting and her scheming uh, cost her the relationship of her children and also probably the relationship with Esau as well. Then she said at the end, the very last thing, I'm sick of my life because of these Hethite girls. These are the, the wives of Esau. If Jacob marries someone from around here like these Hethite girls, what good is my life? And she never saw her son again. So just to wrap up very briefly, it's a sad story, isn't it? It's an amazing story, but it's a sad story of, of a family in turmoil, a family who did not know how to work together to uh, live in harmony, a family who showed favorites, a family who made decisions that affected the historical uh, uh, descendancy of both of the boys. Uh, they, de they determined their, uh, uh, their relationship for years to come. And just if maybe we take from this uh, for ourselves, that if we make decisions in our life, they should be made with a godly perspective. They should be made with a godly uh, uh, view of how we should live our lives how we should live with our wives, how we should live with our children. The decisions we make, realizing decisions, have a, a real-world consequence. So we want to make sure that the things we do and the things we say and the decisions we make are ones that are going to be pleasing to God and are going to make a difference in how our children grow and how our, our families cooperate together. So thank you for being patient this morning with such a massive passage of Scripture. Uh, let's pray together. Why don't we all stand and pray? Heavenly Father, how we thank you for this morning that we can come together, that we can fellowship with one another. We can sing praises to your name, Lord. That we can uh, enjoy the presence of each other. That we can uh, spend time in your word. That you can instruct us, Lord that you can show us uh, your will for our lives. You can show us, Lord, how we need to walk as children of God. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you care for us in such a deep and meaningful way. We thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much that you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus, to come and die for us. And he was raised on the third day and uh, declared victory over death. And we, how, Lord, how we thank you for that. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we go from this place, that we would be a light in a dark place, that we'd be a witness of the goodness of God, that we'd take the opportunities that you give us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those who have never heard. <clears throat> Thank you, Heavenly Father, for blessing us. Thank you for meeting our needs. We love you this day, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And if you would, take the cups that are found in the, uh, in the baskets on your benches today. <clears throat> Before we take the, the communion, I'd just like to ask you a question. 
If you were to die today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? Are you convinced that at your death you would find yourself in the presence of God? Because there really is no more important question than that, is there? Now the answer to that can be very, very simple. If you've ever put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that we put our faith in him alone to save us, to pay for our sins, and to give us eternal life. If you've never done that, you can do that today. If you have done it, what a wonderful thing it is to be a, a Christian, a child of God. So I just like to put out there that if you have questions about your eternal destiny, just think about this. The Lord Jesus Christ came and he died for all sins of all mankind forever. He died for your sins, died for my sins. When I was 33 years old, that finally sunk into my hard head. And I put my faith in Jesus Christ very simply. I didn't know much about the Bible. But I knew that Jesus died for me and I put my faith in him and he saved me that day, that instant. And I'm saved today, not because I'm good, not because he did anything worthy of forgiveness, but because of the grace of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if that's not your testimony today, you can do it even while you sit here. Put your faith in Christ and enjoy eternal life, the free gift that Christ has purchased for you on the cross and through his resurrection. Now, if you are a Christian, now's a great time to be reminded of what Christ did for us. Jesus, uh, Paul said on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. So let's remember the Lord Jesus together. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. So let's remember him together. Dear Lord, how we thank you for your shed blood, your broken body, your resurrection. How we thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness to us, your grace and your mercy and your love. We just pray, Lord, that it would be the reality in the hearts of each of these folks today. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
as we leave this place, that you may empower us through your spirit to seek and save the lost through the power of your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Hello again. Thank you, everybody, for worshiping together this morning. I am Marisa, and um, just want to welcome those of you who are visiting for the first time today. If you would like to get to know us here at Cross Point, you can visit the connections table um, just right out the back there. And after the service, we'll have people who are ready and willing to get to know you and talk with you. Um, and there's also a card there that you can fill out if you would like to remain in touch and learn more about how to be connected with our body here. Um, we uh, switching to giving. Um, all of us here, when we give, it contributes to the gospel being proclaimed here in Central Florida and throughout the world. So um, thank you for your giving. And there's different ways that you can give. If you would like to give today or on a regular basis, there's a few different ways that you can do that. You can text 84321, or you can also go to the Church Center app. You can go to our website at xpoint.com, and you can give that way as well. Um, and thank you for your giving. We only have a couple announcements today. The first is um, on April 20th. There's a women's gathering. If you would like to join and play Bunko, uh, it's going to be at Candy's home starting at 4.30 on April 20th. And uh, if you'd like more information about that, um, Candy's not here today, but there's other women here that can help you. You can always start at the connections table if you have any questions about that. And then the other is if you are willing to help rearrange and get things back together with the tables and uh, to just prepare back for the school the way it was before we came this morning, that would be a huge help. So thank you, and for our benediction today, I would like to say a prayer over all of us from Psalm 23. So if you would go ahead and stand, please. Yeah. I just pray that we would know um, and notice today and all the days of our life God's goodness and mercy following us. Amen. Let's go and be the church. <laughs>